great honor to introduce Professor Khalidi. Um, this conference marks the 25th anniversary of um, his, um, his seminal book, Palestinian Identity and the, the Construction of Modern uh, National Consciousness. I'll now hand over to Professor Khalidi. He'll be speaking about Palestinian identity 25 years after. Thank you very much uh, for that introduction. Um, and thanks uh, for inviting me to take part in what sounds like an absolutely fascinating conference. Um, I'm not gonna actually talk very much about that book. Um, if you've read it, uh, you'll know what's in it. And if you haven't, I invite you to do so, but there's no way in 25 or 30 minutes that I could summarize it. What I'm gonna do is offer some reflections on what I think has changed in the time uh, since I wrote the book in 19, since the book was published in 1997, um, and since I was writing it and researching it uh, throughout the early 1990s. Um, and I will offer reflections on how what has happened, what was happening at the time affected the way that I, I, I looked at the issue of Palestinian identity. And I'll reflect also on how um, things may have changed um, in the intervening 25 years. Um, at the time that this book was published in 1997, pal the identity of Palestinians, Palestinian identity itself was paradoxically both reaffirmed and called into question. Um, it was both being, in other words, treated in a different way than it had been in the past and uh, was being questioned in different ways um, than it had, had been in the past. Um, Palestinian identity was apparently being reaffirmed as a result of the participation by a Palestinian delegation in an international conference alongside Israel for the first time in history. This was the Madrid conference in 1991. Um, as you may know, previously exclusion of Palestinians from any consideration of their fate had been the rule that was the rule at the time of the adoption of the Mandate for Palestine in 1922 by the League of Nations, um, with the minor exception of the St. James Palace Conference, where there was no direct negotiation with the Israelis. It was also the rule uh, in subsequent years. Uh, the United Nations adopted uh, the resolution to partition, partition Palestine in 1947 without the participation uh, of the Palestinians. Um, this conference in Madrid had been followed by the first ever official uh, direct Palestinian-Israeli negotiations, uh, first in Washington, DC, uh, under the aegis of the US government. Uh, the negotiations took place in the bowels of the State Department itself, and then later secretly uh, in Oslo. Um, these negotiations had led to an agreement between the PLO and Israel, the so-called Oslo Accords. The presence of Yasser Arafat alongside uh, President Clinton and Israeli Prime Minister Rabin um, at the 1993 signature ceremony of these accords on the White House front lawn uh, seemed to reaffirm that the Palestinian people had received international recognition and were on the brink of achieving statehood and self-determination. Nearly 30 years after these events, it's obvious that this was not the case and that recognition did not lead to an end to the colonization and occupation of Palestine. They continue, obviously and have continued ever since. Nor did this recognition signal the inevitability of Palestinian freedom and independent statehood. Far from it. If anything, freedom and statehood are farther away than they seemed in 1993. The Oslo Accords instead have ushered in a steep escalation of Zionist colonization of Palestine. The settlement enterprise has expanded to over 800,000 people and occupied uh, Arab East Jerusalem and the occupied West Bank. Um, it's led to the enforcement, entrenchment, and reinforcement of Israel's military occupation. Um, and it's led to the continuation unstinting, of unstinting US financial, military, and diplomatic support for the subjugation of the Palestinians and for the colonization of Palestine. That colonization takes place with American money raised in this country in order to expand the colonization process uh, in the occupied territories. These outcomes were only apparent much later, uh, with the exception of a prescient uh, few observers, like Edward Said, 
who from the outset called Oslo a Palestinian Versailles. But even at the time that Palestinian identity was published in 1997, notwithstanding all the American and Israeli hoopla about the Oslo Accords and the PLO's uh, delusions about those accords, it was apparent that there still existed a deep undercurrent of questioning of the legitimacy of Palestinian identity and of the Palestinian narrative in the West generally, um, and of course in Israel as well. Um, <clears throat> I realized this myself as early as 1991. Uh, at the time, I was in the middle of doing the research for this book. Uh, I had not even begun to write it in 1991. And at that time, I was asked to serve as an advisor to the Palestinian delegation that was supposed to go to the Madrid and Washington negotiations. Once I became involved in those negotiations, uh, which went on until the summer of 1993, I very quickly came to understand that neither the United States nor the Israeli delegations, nor the mainstream media in both countries, the United States and Israel, that faithfully reflected the official views in those two countries, saw the Palestinians as the equals of the Israelis, or saw them as entitled to the same rights as Israelis. This was manifested in the summary rejection by the Israeli delegation with full US support of every concept and proposal the Palestinian delegation tried to put on the table in the 10 negotiating sessions that ran from October 1991 until June of 1993. There was no official recognition by either the United States or Israel that the core problem was colonization, was military occupation, was the theft of land and water, was the ethnic cleansing of the Palestinians uh, in 1948 and afterwards, and the suppression of their rights, or, or, or that any of these things uh, were uh, 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 even had even occurred or were occurring as the Palestinian delegation in Washington insisted. This basic dynamic of the situation in Palestine since 1948, before 1948, and afterwards was never accepted uh, by the Israeli side or by their American diplomatic allies in Washington. Uh, these allies, these American diplomats who were involved were sometimes even more militantly Zionist uh, than the Israeli delegation themselves. Uh, Aaron David Miller, who was one of the American diplomats involved in these negotiations, in fact, called uh, the uh, American negotiators uh, Israel's lawyers. Um, these ideas are still ideas that reject that colonization, occupation, land theft, ethnic cleansing are at the root of the problem are still not accepted by the United States government, by the government of Israel, and by most European countries as the basic dynamic uh, in Palestine. Um, instead, everything uh, that took place in the negotiations at Washington and that later took place secretly in the negotiations uh, in Oslo, everything was based on the false premise that Israel and the Palestinians were two equal parties, whereas in fact, the negotiations took place on a base of, basis of complete inequality between a people half under occupation and half dispersed and dispossessed, negotiating with its colonizer under ground rules devised by, for this purpose by the colonizer and its American allies. The, the, this was not an equal negotiation. This was not a negotiation that could in fact lead to any outcome other than the one uh, that, that it produced, which is to say the Oslo Accords and continued subjugation. Um, this has most recently been illustrated in a book by Professor Seth, Seth Anziska of University College Lon London called Preventing Palestine, in which he illustrates how what happened in the negotiations in Washington and later um, in Oslo, producing the Oslo Accords, in fact, were driven by a, a very low ceiling established much, much earlier. Uh, between Menachem Begin, uh, President Sadat of Egypt, uh, and uh, President Carter of the United States at the Camp David Accords of 1978. All of this was the, the basis for what we went through uh, in Washington uh, and the negotiations in Oslo. Um, <clears throat> after I had stepped away from the negotiations and went back to writing this book or, or finishing the research for this book and beginning to write it, um, and uh, later saw the text of the Oslo Accords just before they were signed. 
uh, accords, which I have to stress were negotiated secretly and behind the backs of the delegation that was negotiating uh, openly with Israel in Washington uh, and without our knowledge. After I saw the text of this, these accords, I immediately realized that the PLO leadership in Tunis had fully accepted the false framing imposed by the United States and Israel that we in Washington had rejected. Um, on this basis, that leadership accepted a deal designed to preclude rather than achieve the exercise of their rights by the Palestinian people. That was the objective of Oslo from the Israeli and American uh, point of view. Um, <clears throat> this experience over two and a half years, which took place as I was completing the research and beginning the writing of Palestinian identity, uh, undoubtedly influenced my thinking in the shaping of that book. Um, it also led me to refuse an invitation to attend the White House uh, signing ceremony in September of 1993. It led me to write an op-ed that was published in the New York Times in September of 1993, uh, in which I questioned whether the accords that were being signed would or could lead to a just and equitable outcome. Obviously, they hadn't done that. Uh, very soon afterwards, uh, very soon after 1993, ordinary Palestinians realized that the Oslo Accords had in fact made their situation much worse and not better. And that these accords could not lead to freedom and liberation, but only to further servitude and subjugation. Uh, by the end of 1990s, uh, by the end of the 1990s, the Palestinians under occupation were subject to much more colonization. The settlement enterprise expanded uh, uh, many fold in the years uh, after 1993. They were subject to many more restrictions on movement, more walls, more checkpoints, more bypass roads, more creation of isolated uh, Palestinian cantons uh, within a sea of Israeli settlements, uh, more uh, 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 restrictions of other kinds uh, on work in Israel uh, and, uh, and on entry and exit into uh, occupied Palestine. And finally, were experiencing a lower GDP per capita than had been the case before the Oslo Accords were signed. Um, in consequence of their experience, a much harsher situation uh, as a direct result of the Oslo Accords, uh, Palestinians under occupation rose up in 2000 in a second intifada, the so-called second intifada, which initially was made up of demonstrations and nonviolent uh, 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 protests against the occupation, but uh, in dint of, of Isra Israeli security forces firing hundreds of thousands of bullets at these demonstrators, it became an armed uprising. As soon as Palestinians launched that uprising, they were described by Israel and the United States and by the tame media in those two countries as terrorists and as undermining a sacred peace process rather than as a people resisting oppression. Um, let me talk a little bit about what, what has changed since then. Because while on the official level in the United States and in most European countries and in the mainstream corporate media uh, in both the United States and, and most European countries, this framing in terms of terrorism and in terms of Palestinians rejecting the peace process has continued right down to the present with the victim described as the aggressor, and the colonizer and occupier uh, pretending to be the victim. On another level, much has changed in the United States over the past 25 years since this book was published. Uh, this is true among vast swaths of an entire generation of younger people in the United States in particular, um, among younger, more liberal segments of the Jewish community in the United States, in much of academia, and on many, many college campuses and university campuses, and in numerous liberal Christian denominations, the Methodists, the Presbyterians, and so forth, as well uh, as among larger and larger numbers of members of minority communities in the United States. There has been a sea change in all of these segments of the American population. And there is consistent polling over many years now, several years now, that shows uh, the shift, especially among younger Americans within the Jewish community, among Christian denominations, in many unions, among minorities, and so forth. Now, many factors have influenced this change. Importantly, in the non-mainstream media 
especially on social media, a vast range of information about what is actually happening in Palestine is available today that was unavailable 25 years ago. I cannot stress how important this is. 25 years ago in the United States, there were three or four main channels for seeing what was going on, television channels. There were a few prestigious newspapers. There were two news agencies, AP and UPI. And there was a very, very limited range of other uh, 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 media uh, venues in which people could actually find out what was happening. There was in effect the uh, possibility of uh, 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 control of what people saw. Uh, very often reality burst those limits, but by and large, you could not get an unfiltered vision of what was happening in Palestine from the mainstream corporate media. That is no longer the case today. Uh, social media by itself has played an enormous role in this, but uh, alternative non-mainstream media play a, a, a very big role. Uh, people are more sophisticated. They are more able to find out what is actually going on. And this device, the camera phone, has enabled ordinary citizens to film and broadcast to the world exactly what is happening in Palestine. Uh, that has had an enormous impact. Social media, alternative media, the capability of ordinary citizens to describe and report on, and, and most importantly, uh, photograph and film what is happening, uh, has shown the utter falsehood of most of what is put out by the US Israeli governmental mouthpieces and the mainstream corporate media megaphone that amplifies their disinformation and their distortions of reality. A perfect example of this is how the lies that were put out systematically one after another by the Israeli government and that were supported initially by US uh, officials uh, about Israel's murder of the Al Jazeera uh, journalist Shirin Abu Atli, how these, this systematic barrage of lies was dismantled one after another after another by a sequence of reports and uh, fearless journalistic investigations, such that no one believes these lies today, except blind partisans of Israel. This couldn't have happened in the past. A cover-up would have taken place instantaneously and would have been sustained uh, and would have been impossible uh, to blow away. Um, it, it, is, it, is, it is infinitely more difficult to cover up something like this. Um, thanks to these fundamental changes in public opinion, and thanks to the availability of alternative sources of information in social media and in non-mainstream media, the kinds of arguments that I made in Palestinian identity, for example, about the recent and constructed nature, nature of national identities, both Zionist and Palestinian, which were highly controversial 25 years ago as far as Israel is concerned, are gaining acceptance among large sectors of the US population. Uh, you couldn't question Zionism in any way, manner, shape, or form 25 years ago. Zionism uh, and, and, and its tenets as an essentially discriminatory ideology uh, as, and, and, and the Zionist project as a settler colonial project, uh, the, the, the regime that is maintained in Israel as an apartheid regime. These are ideas that are openly debated today. They may still be controversial, but they were completely verboten. They could not be brought into mainstream political discourse 25 years ago. All of that has changed. The very existence of the Palestinians, the fact that they are a people with legitimate national rights in their homeland, indeed their very indigeneity in Palestine, ideas which to this day are still called into question by some vocal partisans of Israel, are increasingly broadly accepted. The Palestinians exist, people recognize that. The fact that they are a people with legitimate national rights is accepted today by larger and larger uh, proportions of the population. Uh, the fact that Palestine is their homeland, the fact that they are the indigenous population, uh, all of these things are ideas which even though they're still challenged uh, are increasingly broadly accepted. So is a framing uh, of what is happening in Palestine as a settler colonial war on the Palestinians, which in fact was the framing that I used in my most recent book of the Hundred Years War on Palestine. Um, and, and, and the framing and, or rather an understanding of the system imposed by Israel on the entirety of Palestine as an apartheid regime uh, 
are now at least open for discussion. These were ideas that could not be spoken of in polite company in the United States, at least uh, 25 years ago. Today, as I've said, they're widely debated, even if they are fiercely contested, especially via the insidious, uh, the employment of the insidious smear of anti-Semitism to shut down debate and as a last ditch defense against any criticism of the policies of Israel. Now, if this is the way, as I'm suggesting, in which Palestinian identity, or at least the understanding of Palestinian identity has changed in the United States over the past 25 years. How has Palestinian identity itself changed in practice uh, over the same period? I'm not suggesting that the historical account that I gave of the development of Palestinian identity in the late 19th and especially in the early 20th century um, um, has necessarily changed. Uh, if I were to revise the book or rewrite the book, I might uh, uh, change some of it. But the question I'm asking now is how has the actual identity of the Palestinians, their sense of self as a people, changed uh, over uh, the, the past 25 years? And how is the way in which it is viewed changed? Um, uh, 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 which is a question I've already touched on, but which I think is affected as well by how the way Palestinians themselves see their national identity uh, may have uh, changed and been modified uh, over the past quarter of a century. I'm going to suggest five ways in which the Palestinian national self-view, if you want, has changed uh, since 1997. The first way is that I think it is more rooted in Palestine and much less rooted in the Palestinian diaspora in the surrounding Arab countries or farther afield. The diaspora remains important. Uh, and I think the, the diaspora farther afield in many ways is more important than the diaspora in the immediate uh, surrounding countries in Lebanon, Syria, and Jordan. Um, the Palestinian diaspora in the Gulf, the Palestinian diaspora in Europe, the Palestinian diaspora in Latin America and North America are important. But Palestinian identity itself, I think, is much more rooted in Palestine. And that is partly a result uh, of the Oslo Accords and the return of the PLO leadership uh, and of the center of gravity of Palestinian politics. Uh, to Palestine. That's a process that started with the defeat of the PLO in Lebanon in 1982. It started with the exile of the PLO to Tunis and other places. Mm -hmm. It started with the second, with the first Intifada in 1987, this move of the central focus of Palestinian identity back to Palestine. Um, but I think that the Oslo Accords uh, and, and subsequent events have cemented that shift in Palestinian identity, which I repeat is now more rooted in Palestine uh, uh, than in the Palestinian diaspora, which is where the, the renaissance of Palestinian national identity began. The, 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 the diaspora was, was, was the, the place in which uh, this renaissance took place. So that's the first change, I think, in Palestinian identity. A second change or a second uh, feature of Palestinian identity that I think is important uh, in, in the present is that this identity is just as strongly supported by Arab public opinion as it was before and after Oslo. We have been told by the mainstream corporate media, by the American government, by the Israeli government, that the Arabs are tired of Palestine, that the Arabs don't support Palestine, that the normalization of relations with about half of the countries in the Arab world that have one form or another of relations with the state of Israel, some have peace treaties, some have normalization agreements, two have peace treaties, uh, four have normalization agreements, several others uh, have other forms of relationships with Israel. We are told that all of this amounts to the abandonment by quote unquote, the Arabs of the Palestine cause. Uh, I think anybody who happened to look at the World Cup um, over the past several weeks can see that that is not the case. Where our public opinion is allowed to express itself in a region dominated by authoritarian, dictatorial, and other uh, and monarchical regimes of an absolute nature, public opinion hasn't changed one bit. And when they were allowed to express it as Arab, Arabs who attended uh, the, the World Cup and the Arab teams that played in the World Cup, it was perfectly clear that the Palestine flag and the Palestine cause was just as close uh, to the hearts of, of people in the Arab world uh, as it had ever been. 
Um, in fact, uh, in some ways, this demonstration of support for Palestine indicates a, a new surge in spite of and in opposition to the so-called normalization by unrepresentative, undemocratic regimes, which don't represent the views or feelings uh, of, of their peoples. Um, there's a headline in the Washington Post yesterday, at the World Cup, the Arab world rallies to Palestine. And I think that perfectly illustrates what we saw in every scene from the World Cup, the Moroccan team yesterday, raising the flag of Palestine as they gathered on the pitch. Uh, to celebrate their victory over Spain. And that has happened at every game in which an Arab team was involved and in many games in which Arab teams weren't involved, where people in the stands were chanting uh, in support of Palestine. Israeli reporters have been shocked to find that in fact, the Arab people, the, the, the Arab, uh, the Arab uh, uh, individuals whom they interviewed uh, had not gone along with their unrepresentative, undemocratic authoritarian governments in welcoming Israel. Uh, and that they still felt as strongly about Palestine as they ever had. And I think this is a very important uh, element of Palestinian identity. It is and has always been supported uh, by uh, a, a broad consensus uh, throughout the Arab world. Uh, I, I, I argued this was the case in Palestinian identity 25 years ago. I talked about the hundreds and hundreds of newspaper articles published in Arab newspapers, Arabic newspapers all over the region. Uh, before 1914, literally several hundred, I think I saw as many as 500 newspaper articles uh, over a seven or eight year period before 1914. This situation hasn't changed one bit. We saw this at the World Cup. So that's the second uh, uh, ongoing feature of Palestinian identity. The third is that divisions between the different parts of Palestine, the Gaza Strip, the West Bank, occupied Arab East Jerusalem, uh, uh, the areas of Palestine incorporated into Israel in 1948. The divisions between these regions, which were created and exacerbated by Israeli policy, or mainly created and have been exacerbated by Israeli policy, have in fact diminished. This was illustrated by the trans-Palestinian solidarity within Palestine and among many people in the diaspora uh, that was shown uh, during the upheaval of May 2021, and as I think been shown ever since. Um, a fourth characteristic, I'm going, to, I'm going to try and wrap up here. The fourth characteristic uh, is that today there is no national address for the Palestinians. There is no unified central national movement as there was in the 1930s for all its weaknesses and flaws, as there was uh, in the, PLO, uh, the era of PLO dominance from the 60s through the 1980s. Today, there is no such national, unified national address, no central no, no central leadership for the Palestinians. Instead, we have squabbling, self-interested political factions that are completely discredited, that are unrepresentative of the Palestinians, uh, and that have no legitimacy, um, whether they're in Ramallah or whether they're in Gaza. Instead, what we have is Palestinian civil society and amorphous networks that are taking the lead uh, in Palestinian politics, in Palestinian activism, uh, and uh, we see this insofar as BDS is concerned, the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement is not led by Palestinian political factions. They have nothing to do with it. It's led by civil society organizations. This is true as well as uh, for activism on campus, which is self-organized. This is true as well for the sporadic armed resistance that's taking place in different parts of Palestine. This is not being run from any central address. And there is no central address. There is no Palestinian diplomacy. There is no Palestinian information strategy. There is no Palestinian strategy because there is no central organized unified Palestinian national movement at the moment. Instead, what we have are uh, civil society and amorphous networks taking the lead. Finally, insofar as Palestinian identity and understanding by the Palestinians of their situation is concerned, I think there's a growing realization among Palestinians that serious informational, diplomatic, artistic, and cultural work in the West is essential for Palestinian liberation. If Israel is truly a settler colonial enterprise, as well, of course, as a national reality, which it also is, it has that dual nature. If it is a settler colonial enterprise, then its metropole in the United States and Europe is an essential site of struggle. And I think that's being realized by Palestinians at the grassroots level by young Palestinians, by Palestinian students, by Palestinian civil society, even if the discredited bankrupt bureaucrats who uh, uh, 
claim to represent uh, the Palestinian national movement are too, too foolish and ignorant and blind to understand that. Let me conclude by saying, I don't want to make any particular claims for this book, uh, Palestinian identity. I do not think that in and of itself, it's had a particularly significant impact beyond academic and activist circles. Maybe it's had some effect in those circles, but I don't think it's had much of an effect beyond that. But looking how, at how reception of the ideas that this book puts forward about Palestinian identity has changed, how the reception of these ideas has changed over the past quarter century, and how these ideas have become more mainstream, it's clear that this book formed part of a broad shift in the understanding globally, but particularly in the West, the United States and Europe, of what is happening in Palestine. Of course, this shift has yet to lead to liberation for the Palestinians, who in many ways are more oppressed than they were in 1997. But a profound shift in this direction, in the direction of understanding of this issue, a proper understanding of this issue, is at an absolute precondition for Palestinian liberation, which has to be achieved in some measure in what Edward Said described as the political battle for Palestine in the international world, world in which ideas, representation, rhetoric, and images are at issue. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Professor Khalidi, for your fascinating talk. We will now move on to the Q&A box. Um, can I encourage everyone to put your questions in the Q&A box? We already have a couple of questions already in there. The first one being, what are some of the manifestations of the Zionist program in the lives of Palestinians or proponents of the Arab view in the dispo Disparate, disparate, yeah, disparate, and yes, right. um, uh, yeah, especially in the US. Um, would you say that the war on the Palestinians extended to include them, and how? Yeah. Um. Well, let me say that um, the. War on Palestine, what I describe as the war on Palestine in my most recent book, The 100 Years War on Palestine, um, is, an, is part of what has always been a global war. Um, Zionism did not start in Palestine. Zionism started in Eastern Europe. Zionism was a result of European phenomena, of, of endemic, deep-rooted, hateful European anti-Semitism. It was a response of European Jewish communities suffering under that anti-Semitism in the Russian Empire and the Austrian Hungarian Empire and in other parts of Europe, um, as a result of literally millennia of persecution by the Christian West of its Jewish minority. Uh, and the Zionist project has always been based outside um, the, the, the Biltmore program of 1942, which was the first time that the Zionist movement proclaimed that its objective was taking over all of Palestine, took place here in New York. The funding, the financing, the support for this project has always been based outside of Palestine. Um, however important the process of taking over land, of creating a military and a state structure, of uh, uh, ethnic cleansing of Palestine, however important those processes in Palestine were, they were supported by an absolutely essential network abroad uh, and a battle, not just to secure diplomatic support, not just to collect the finances necessary for this uh, uh, colonial project, but also to uh, obtain the support in public opinion that was necessary in the United States, in Britain, and other European countries uh, for this colonial project. So this battle has always been going on here in the United States there in the United Kingdom and in other parts of the West, which are the metropole for this project. It's a very unusual colonial project. It's not an extension of the population of the sovereignty of the metropole. When Britain goes to Palestine and, 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 and implements the mandate for Palestine, it's not doing it so on behalf of English or Welsh or Scottish settlers in Palestine. It's doing it so on behalf of an independent national project which is colonizing Palestine with the support of Britain. It's unlike Ireland, it's unlike Algeria, it's unlike South Africa, 
in that respect. It has always had an independent separate base in the United States and Europe. And so the struggle, the battle has always been here. The difference is Zionists always understood this. Palestinians have never understood this until, until the current generation. Um, and so yes, that battle affects Palestinians in the United States. It, Palest it affects their supporters in the United States and in Europe. The persecution of activists supporting the idea of Palestinian rights in Europe is even fiercer than it is in the United States. But that persecution is universal. Um, you are smeared as being an anti-Semite if you criticize Israel. You are smeared as an anti-Semite if you talk about Palestinian rights uh, in the United States and elsewhere. There are places that are, that are even worse than the United States, like Germany, um, where uh, uh, the very discussion of Palestine in schools and universities in conferences uh, is forbidden uh, and, and banned and, and treated uh, by the harshest legal measures. So yes, this battle is going on everywhere. Absolutely. Thanks for that. Um, we have another question that is, that was, what is the role of a historian while taking part in negotiations? Well, um, there were there were a couple of us who were either historians or or students of this issue. Uh, over a very long period, who were involved mainly as advisors to the Palestinian delegation in, in, uh, in Washington. Sadly, the people that the PLO sent to Oslo included no one who knew anything about, it, about the history of Palestine, no one who knew anything about the legal uh, 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 ramifications of a negotiation, nobody who had proper English. Uh, it was a delegation that did not include anybody with that kind of background. And that's one reason that the Oslo Accords uh, are such a are such a dog's breakfast, such a terrible, terrible um, uh, mishmash that entirely respond to Israeli desiderata and not to Palestinian desiderata. Um, what is the role of a historian? Well, I, I mean, I tried to bring what I could uh, to that uh, process. I don't know how much I succeeded. I was constantly aware of the fact that what I was doing was part of something that was historically important. And I published a book uh, called Brokers of Deceit about that negotiating process. And I've tried to reflect it uh, in everything that I've written ever since. Um, I think it's, it's, it's illuminated my understanding of international diplomacy. I, I started off as a, as a postgraduate student at Oxford uh, working uh, on, uh, among other things, international diplomacy around Palestine. And I have learned a great deal from involvement in these negotiations. Uh, what I brought to them, I can't say. And um, then we have another question that is, how did US policies during the Cold War exacerbate the uh, issues within the Middle East? Yeah. Um, well, I think that both American and Soviet policies exacerbated the situation in the Middle East. Um, and uh, that was also true for American domestic politics. They exacerbated the situation in the Middle East. Um, the two sides during the Cold War, the Americans and the Soviets, were mainly interested in obtaining advantage at the expense of the other. Um, they paid very little attention to um, resolving this conflict. What they wanted to do is to make sure that it did not develop into a nuclear conflict between them. And so when things seemed to be getting out of hand, as during the October War, there was high level contact between in, this, in that case, Secretary of State Kissinger and the Soviet leadership in Moscow, uh, where Kissinger actually went after being involved in, in shuttle negotiations in the Middle East during the, the last days of the October 1973 war. So that they were willing to do to prevent the situation in, in, the, in the Middle East from getting out of hand, such that it led to an unlimited superpower confrontation. More than that, they were not willing to do. Um, and the United States and its so-called peacemaking efforts since then has mainly directed those efforts at eliminating Soviet influence, ending the, 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 the conflict between the Arab states and Israel and ignoring the Palestine question that's at the core of the problem. So the United States helped to make peace between Egypt and Israel to bring Egypt into the American column during the Cold War and to eliminate the possibility of the Arab states going to war with Israel because without, without Egypt, the Arab states have no, had, no, had and have no military capability to confront Israel. Uh, so the United States had objectives of ending the conflict in that sense, but not of ending the root causes of the conflict, which 
started and continue to be in Palestine. Uh, thanks for that. And we have another one that is, do you think the so-called two-state solution is still viable? And if not, do you have a vision of, for a way ahead for the Palestinian people? If I had a vision of the way ahead for the Palestinian people, I wouldn't be speaking to you. I'd be a politician up on the soapbox putting that vision forward. Um, I don't have any such vision. <laughs> Um, if you read my last book, the, the Hundred Years War on Palestine, I, I lay out some of the principles I think that the solution has to be based on. It has to be based on absolute equality. There are now two peoples there. Yes, this is a colonial settler project. Yes, all kinds of structures were created that are structurally unequal. Uh, yes, there's going to have to be some form of decolonization of Palestine, but ultimately, you still have two peoples there. And there have to be absolutely equal rights for every individual and for every group in whatever outcome uh, results for that outcome to be sustainable uh, and, 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 and stable over the long term. That means absolutely equal political rights, religious rights, collective rights, national rights for everybody, Palestinians and Israelis. And that means dismantling a structure of discrimination which deprives one group of rights in order to provide uh, rights for others, and not just rights, privileges, uh, and, and property, and, and all kinds of other uh, advantages. That, the dismantling of that, the de the, the, what, I, what I call the decolonization of Palestine, is not going to be an easy process, and I, I'm not sure how we can, how we can go, go forward towards that. I would say, though, uh, that the two-state solution, uh, which had very many disadvantages, uh, every two-state solution produced the 1937 Peel plan, the 1947 Partition plan, and the ludicrous plan produced at Oslo, uh, enormously disadvantaged the Palestinians and enormously privileged uh, Israel or, or, the, or, the, or the Zionist project before 1948. Um, th those, are not, those are not a framework, a just and last, sustainable, lasting framework for a solution. You could possibly have two states. I'm not sure how you could do it, but you'd have to contend with the fact that ever since the Zionist project began, it intended to create a single Jewish state in the entirety of Palestine. There never was an intention for Jews to live in a minority, as a minority in Palestine. There never was an intention for there to be two states. There was the intention for there to be a Jewish state. That's what Herzl wrote. And that's what the Zionist project intended from the beginning and contends to, the, to this day. Those, those Israelis who call for two states, in some cases, I think are entirely sincere. Uh, a few of the, of, the, of the outside parties who call for, for it may be sincere, but I think there's a great deal of hypocrisy. They're not talking about two equal states. They're not talking about a partition in which uh, some of the injustices and some of the, or all of the injustices that were inflicted as a result of the creation of Israel are, are, are made up for. Thanks for that. Um, we have another question that says that you, uh, you talked about lacking of national leadership in Palestine. What do you think will happen in the next 25 years and what will we, what will we see if you can? Yeah, well, I, my, 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 uh, my means of dodging these kinds of questions is to say that the job description of a historian does not include predicting the future. I have no idea what kind of. Uh, what kind of uh, national leadership the Palestinians will have in 25 years. Um, I can tell you that historically they have gone through cycles uh, whereby they have had uh, better or worse leadership, often, often not very good leadership uh, historically. Um, and that leadership has come from different classes and different sectors of the population. Um, they are currently in a period very similar in some respects to the period after 1948, where there's an absence of a central unified national leadership. Um, how long that will last, I don't know. What will replace it, I don't know. I think that there's a younger generation in Palestine that's very impatient and that has uh, the potential to produce new forms and new shapes, but what direction that generation will go, I can't, I can't possibly say. Um, our next question is, um, oh, sorry, my computer is, um, if public opinion in many Arab states has not changed towards Palestine, then why would 
why have peace and normalization treaties been signed with Israel and other Arab countries? Because the countries that have done so, and let's name them, Egypt, military dictatorship, Jordan, a country entirely ruled by the secret service, the military and the, and the throne, the Emirates, an absolute monarchy of the sort not seen since Charles I or Louis XIV, Bahrain, a kingdom whose king is kept in power by Saudi intervention against a popular revolution, the Sudan, uh, where a military suppressed is suppressing uh, a popular uprising against it, and Morocco, a country very similar to Jordan. These are not democracies. These are regimes. Israel has made agreements with authoritarian, unrepresentative, undemocratic, illegitimate, unpopular governments, which do not represent the views of their people. That's how and why um, Israel has been able to achieve peace treaties with two countries and normalization agreements with several others. And, and I would add the weakness and the lack of legitimacy and the undemocratic nature of these regimes makes them dependent on external support. And that external support largely from the United States has pushed them in the direction of normalization. It was not an Emirati initiative or an Israeli initiative. It was an initiative by the Trump administration that brought about several of those normalization agreements. Uh, it was uh, admittedly said that himself went to Jerusalem and was largely responsible for the, for the peace treaty that resulted. But we shouldn't forget that Sadat was assassinated in part because public opinion didn't accept what he did. Um, so uh, the Arab public opinion is in one place and the unrepresentative authoritarian regimes of the Arab world are in another place. Those are the, those are the parties that have made either peace treaties or, 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 or normalization agreements with Israel. And then another question is, other than what you mentioned about social media and the spread of video, oh, sorry, just get, we're getting another question in, so let's just move it. Um, um, and the spread of videos of um, evidence in Israel repression, do you think the developments in academia have had such a large impact in the, the change you mentioned, for example, the secular colonial framing of Zionism? I mean, it's, it's hard for me to estimate how much of an impact the change in academia has had. I think it probably has had some, some, something of an impact on, on university campuses um, over time. Um, I'm not sure that it goes much, for, and, and on activist circles. I think the ways in which people understand and now uh, uh, frame um, events in Palestine has, has to some extent been affected by uh, academia. Um, but I don't think it goes much farther than that. I think social media is actually much more important um, in, in changing opinion, broadly speaking. Yeah, um, another question is, um, uh, can you draw through um, oh, sorry, there's another question coming in. It keeps moving the screen. Um, I, I, it says, can I draw a through line between Arabs yeah, there we go. and the centrality of Palestine from the time of the mandates until today? Um, yeah. Yeah, no, I think you can. I think you can see from the period that I, I mentioned in my talk before World War I, where there was an enormous debate about Zionism in Palestine in, in the Arab press. In, in, in the Ottoman parliament, there were debates about Zionism, uh, led by Arab deputies, elected Arab deputies from Palestine and from Syria, uh, raised these issues in the Ottoman parliament uh, in 1911 and 1912. Um, you had in the 1920s and the 1930s, people who came to Palestine to fight with the Palestinians against the British and against the Zionists, a large number of them in the late 1930s, for example. Um, you had others who came to volunteer in 1948 to fight. I'm not talking about the Arab armies that entered Palestine in, uh, after May 15th, 1948. I'm talking about volunteers who came from Syria, and from Lebanon, and from Jordan, and, and, farther, and Egypt, and farther afield. Um, so you, I think you can draw a through line. Um, Arab regimes were, not, were frequently not in tune with their public opinion, either out of fear of Israel or out of fear of Israel's powerful, uh, uh, great power backers. Um, but I think you can draw a through line in terms of popular support for Palestine. Now, it hasn't always taken the same, same forms. Uh, 
and I think it can be criti criticized today for being mainly verbal rather than constituting any form of pressure on these regimes to act uh, on behalf of the Palestinians. Um, but remember, these are fiercely repressive regimes which do not allow expressions of public opinion. Uh, look at Egypt, look carefully at the Emirates, look carefully at Saudi Arabia. It's very difficult to express your opinion in these countries freely if that opinion goes against the policy of the regime. And um, yes, oh, sorry about this. My laptop's deciding to be. Shall I read the question? I can see another Hello? one. Katie, can you hear me? Oh, I can hear you. I think Shall I, I read the next question? Minutes. Then we have, would you consider publishing a history of the Khalidi family? Uh, short answer, no. Um, okay. I've, I've included a lot of family history in my most recent book. And actually, there's a good bit of family history in Palestinian identity. And I think that's more than enough. Yep. And then we've got, given the observations concerning the evolving media and social media landscape, to what extent are changing attitudes towards Palestine in the US driven by a recognition of Palestinian rights and aspirants? Um, often it appears that the narrative regarding Palestine is heavily driven by disapproval over Israel and settler violence. Is there a scope for change in this respect? Yeah, I, 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 that's, a, that's an interesting point. Um, I mean, if one reads critiques, for example, of the new Israeli government, it's mostly what the new Israeli government will do to Jewish citizens of Israel. Oh, my heavens, LGBTQT rights are going to be hard. Oh, my heavens, these people are going to redefine Israeli identity. Oh, my heavens, these people are going to limit democratic freedoms. Oh, my heavens, these people are going to limit judicial freedom. The degree to which this new regime is going to be even more fierce in its attacks on Palestinians is secondary. And I don't think that, that the support for Palestine in, in the West is, 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 is quite as focused on Israeli and Jewish concerns as is the case in Israel. But I think to some extent that is the case. Um, and I think that's partly down to the Palestinians to change it. I mean, it's, it's for the Palestinians to put forward um, what's going on and for them to put forward a vision of how that might be changed uh, and to change the, the narrative and change the discussion uh, in, that, in that direction. Um, that's perfect, thank you. And then the next question is, many Jews from Arab countries used Israel as a refuge. Does this make history, does this make history more complex in what ways um, is it justice for Palestine related to justice to those expelled from communities? You know, I mean, one of the many tragedies that resulted from the rise of, well, from anti-Semitism in Europe, which produced Zionism uh, in its modern political form, um, is that the Jews in the Arab countries were swept away by anti-Jewish feeling that was a really a response to the creation of Israel at the expense of the Palestinians. I'm oversimplifying what happened in countries like Libya, countries like Iraq, countries like Egypt, uh, where Jewish communities were persecuted and in many cases driven out. Um, in other cases, uh, they were moved out, uh, in the case of Yemen, for example, by a deal between the Israeli government, the American government, and the Imam of Yemen. The Jews of Yemen were not suffering any particular persecution at the time. They were flown out in something called Operation Magic Carpet by American C-47s and shipped to Israel as basically cannon fodder for the Israelis to use in building their new state. They needed new immigrants. And the Yemeni Jews were a fertile source of manpower, labor power. Um, but in most cases, they were, they, they were forced to leave and lost their property. And historic Jewish communities that had been there for literally for millennia, like the Iraqi Jewish community or the Egyptian Jewish community, they'd been there for thousands of years, 2,000 years and more, in the case of Iraq, probably more. Um, uh, were destroyed uh, by uh, uh, 
anti-Semitism, but mainly anti-Zionism, which unfortunately took as its target these, these indigenous Jewish communities in Arab countries. And I think that uh, a resolution, uh, uh, justice for Palestine has nothing to do with this. It's a separate issue, but it's a related issue. Um, and it's one of the many things that has to be resolved. Many of these people have now become fervent right-wingers in Israel, uh, people whose parents or grandparents were brought to Israel or forced to flee to Israel or came to Israel, have become fervent right-wingers, virulently anti-Palestinian, rejecting their Arab heritage. These were populations that largely spoke Arabic, Syrian Jews, Egyptian Jews, Iraqi Jews, they spoke Arabic. Many of them were deeply integrated in the social, political, and cultural life lives of their countries. The first finance minister of independent Iraq was a member of the Sassoon family, a distinguished Jewish Baghdad family. Um, many of the leaders of the Egyptian Communist Party were Jews. Many of the most famous artists in the Arab world, singers and so forth, uh, writers were Jewish and wrote in Arabic, uh, spoke Arabic, acted and, 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 and sang in Arabic. Um, some of these people have come to, to, to an understanding such that they want to recover their Arab roots, but many others reject those roots. And in fact, Israeli culture has driven them towards a rejection of these roots. And uh, these are all issues that are gonna have to be resolved. Yes, thank you. We've just got one last question. Um, but is, given Israel has just elected the most conservative government in living, living memory, what um, are the prospects of Palestinian recognition and support? Um, let me find that. Let me find that question. I don't see it. Could you repeat uh, the question? Um, I'm so sorry. Oh, honestly, it's fine. Um, given Israel has just elected um, the most conservative, conservative government in living history, a memory, what, um, pros what are the prospects of Palestinian recognition and support? I think it's in the chat now. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay. I'm looking at the questions. Um, I think that this government actually is going to accelerate the delegitimization of what Israel does in the eyes of some Israelis, I think, but also many supporters of Israel. Uh, it's going to be harder and harder uh, to support the naked oppression of the Palestinians. It's going to become much, much fiercer um, with people like Smotrich and Ben Gvir being given portfolios that enable them to control the lives of Palestinians and to, and to expand the settlement enterprise. Um, it's going to be harder and harder to pretend that this is a liberal democratic system. Um, measures being taken inside Israel to dismantle the independence of the judiciary and so on and so forth uh, will also help in, 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 in destroying that mask of a liberal democracy, which has never been the case for Palestinians, whether citizens of Israel or otherwise. I mean, citizens of Israel who happened to be Arabs were under military rule from 1948 until 1966. What kind of democracy is that? Um, their lands were stolen from them, seized. These are citizens of the state of Israel. It's not a democracy. It's an ethnocracy. It's an apartheid regime, whatever you want to call it. And it's not a democracy in that it rules over a majority of the population under its control, which is Arab, Palestinian, whether they're citizens of Israel or residents of Jerusalem or uh, the residents of the West Bank and, and the Gaza Strip, which is under an Israeli siege. So it's not independent or free or of Israeli control. Um, so I think that this government will actually accelerate some of these processes, which are leading to the delegitimization of what Israel is doing in Palestine. Uh, and I mean, it's gonna be a terrible, terrible time for Palestinians under occupation. It's gonna be a very difficult time for Palestinian citizens of the state of Israel. Um, and we're gonna see a lot of suffering uh, under this new government, but I think that it's gonna have a, an upside, which I, I will call it an upside, it's gonna have an impact uh, which will be very, very negative uh, for what Israel is doing in Palestine. Um, thank you so much for spending your time with us and giving us and allowing us to mark your 25th anniversary of your book. Um, we'll now move on to the next session, but thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me and for giving me this opportunity. Good luck with the rest of the conference.